Cheer us on our journey still, we've seen this wayside hymn. Yonder over the rolling river, where the shiny mansions rise, soon will be our home forever, and the smile of the blessed giver glad.
reason that we gather together. Jesus, on the night that he was betrayed, he was, he was with his disciples, said, do this in remembrance of me. And he was taking the bread and he was taking the food of wine and instructed them on what the significance of that was at the time. Do this in remembrance of me. Jesus also said in John 15, 13 to 14, Greater love has no one than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends, Jesus said, if you do what I command. So as was the example of the early church and, and the example given by the apostles after the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, we partake of this on the first day of every week so that we remember Jesus Christ and what he did for us. It's always good, too, to remember uh, and throughout the Bible, there are many statements made by Jesus and by uh, the apostles and the writers of the New Testament about the significance of this. I particularly like 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3-5, through five, where Peter says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us a new birth a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time.
Every year, the 1st of November, we take the time to, to uh, kind of remember the, the, the history of the, the congregation here in Cave Springs, and next Sunday morning is the first Sunday in November. It's, uh, it's kind of with all of the stuff that's been going on and storms and other, other events and activities that have been happening. We haven't uh, said much about it this year, uh, but uh, this upcoming Sunday will be our homecoming Sunday. And so keep, uh, keep in mind on our homecoming Sunday, we will be, uh, we will be having a noon meal. Uh, and so be, be thinking about that and preparing a potluck for lunch on Sunday. And uh, then we will have a, a singing, which would be an area-wide singing. We have people that come in every year from congregations around the area to sing with us, and and uh, hope everyone be able to be here. Uh, that that usually starts um, at, uh, at I believe two o'clock is when we two thirty when we uh, do that, and then. Uh, and then we'll have a, a service, our, our evening service, usually about 4 o'clock, I think, is when that starts on that day. And so, so that is this upcoming Sunday. Um, it's kind of, kind of uh, come up on us quickly, and we haven't said much about it. Last couple of years, because it was our 100-year anniversary, we did a lot of talking about that day coming, and uh, we just uh, have failed to do so. So um, this upcoming Sunday will be, be that special day for us uh, this year. Also, I um, want to make sure Travis mentioned to me that he forgot to say something about this next weekend is our time change as well. And so be keeping that in mind. These days, our phones and everything, they do say they do that by themselves automatically. I never trust them. I don't know about you. It says it does it, but there, I always go to bed that night just thinking, what if it doesn't change? What if my alarm is not what, what it's supposed to be? I need my old alarm clock back that I set manually. It would make me feel a whole lot better. But time change is what's coming up here this next weekend. I sat in a crowd in Indianapolis, Indiana, many years ago. Jenny and I did, listening to a, a man speak to thousands of business owners this man, he made a statement. It has stuck with me. I've probably used it in the past, but it stuck with me. I don't know why. I only heard it once, and that doesn't usually happen with me. I have to hear something over and over and over again. When I'm memorizing Scripture, I have to use it over and over and over for it to stick. But for some reason, this stuck. He said, he said, you don't know what you don't know. That's why you don't have. So... If you knew what you knew, you would have. Therefore, to know but not to do is still not to know. I have no idea why that stuck. I don't know how I got that down. But that last statement, to know and not to do, is still not to know. One of the things that Jesus continually is trying to impress upon us and what we see all through the New Testament that God wants us to understand is that if we will come to him and if we will ask, we can have. Now we're going to look at passages. There are, there are some, some uh, stipulations that God puts along with that as far as what we ask and what he will provide. But there is a confidence that we have and Jesus here is if you're visiting with us, we have a lot of visitors this morning. We've been walking through the Sermon on the Mount. We, are, we just began Matthew chapter 7 on last Sunday morning. And, and, and so as we look, continue to look at the context, last Sunday we looked at one of the most controversial, probably one of the most misused passages in all of the New Testament, and that is pertaining to judging. And Jesus says, do not judge. And a lot of people then, when you bring something up to them that they disagree with you, or you challenge them on maybe a life choice that they've made, or you talk to them about something that is not being done right in their life, one of the most, most frequently quoted verses is, well, you're, hey, the Bible says, don't judge. And as we saw last week, you're right, it does. 
But have you read verses 2, 3, and 4 and on below that? Because actually, he's telling us that we have a responsibility to judge each other, but we are to judge righteously. We are actually to hold each other accountable. We are to make sure that we are making judgments that are according to God's will. And we are to help each other along the way. And sometimes that means you have got to come to me and say, I see something in your life, Steve, and it's not right. And it needs to change. And I love you enough that I'm willing to come to you and talk to you about it. Because that's not an easy thing to do, to talk to somebody about something in their life that needs to change. But if we love each other, that's what we will do. So I want to make sure that we keep this topic this morning that Jesus moves into in context with what Jesus is dealing with there beginning in chapter, at the beginning of chapter 7. So verses 1 through 6 were about judging properly, making sure we're doing so according to the will of God. Now beginning in verse 7, Jesus is going to move into this topic, this idea of asking and seeking and knocking. Okay? I don't, a lot of times, and in your Bible, many times the paragraphs are even separated. There may even be a heading above the verse 7 or something that, that says, ask, seek, and knock, or so that separates that from verses 1 through 6. We have to be very careful that we don't separate everything too much. Because a lot of times we just go to these verses and we pull these out and we just look at what these mean, and we don't look at everything around it to see how does this fit with everything else that Jesus has already said. And what he's going to say after. Because immediately after this, in verse 11, we're going to get the golden rule. And so, how does all of this work together? Well, looking last week at this idea of judging, one thing that becomes very clear is that it requires great wisdom, godly wisdom, in order for us to be able to make proper judgments in our own life, and while we're trying to help each other, keep each other accountable, keep each other focused on the will of God in their lives. Wisdom is a must. Well, we've talked about so far as we've gone through our study of the Sermon on the Mount, as well as on Sunday evenings we're studying the, the letter of James. And we've seen over and over how these two just, they fit hand in glove. James, the brother of Jesus, as he's writing his letter, he uses so much of the teaching of Jesus that we find right here in the Sermon on the Mount. Well, this is no different. We see in James chapter 1, James deals with, what if I need wisdom in my life? And it's in a context of of, um, making right choices, making judgments. If I am tempted, if I am struggling with something... And he says, if you lack wisdom, look what James says, James 1 verse 5. But if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all generously and without reproach, and it will be given to him. But he must ask in faith, without doubting. For the one who doubts is like the surf of the sea, driven and tossed by the wind. For that man ought not to expect that he will receive anything from the Lord, being double-minded man, unstable in all his ways." So James, after talking about the struggles of life and how to deal with those struggles, he says, do you need more wisdom to help you deal with these things? Do you need to know more? Do you need to be able to see things better from God's perspective? That's the way I define and look at wisdom, godly wisdom. There's knowledge. We can have knowledge of God's will. We can, we can know what God has said, But how do I use that? I need to be able to see things the way that God sees them. The great news is, is God tells us how he sees things. But God promises us, James tells us, that if we ask him, he will bless us with wisdom in abundance. Now, it doesn't make, it's not a surprise then, that when we see Jesus teaching on this idea of making judgments in our lives, that the very next thing he does is he says, ask, seek, and knock. Asking God, seeking what is needed, and knocking and waiting for that response from God 
It's exactly what James was talking about in James chapter 1. And so we can't separate what what Jesus was talking about in the first six verses of chapter 7 and take the rest of it following it as something different. It really does all fit together. Now, the principle that we see that Jesus is teaching here really is perseverance. In our English Bibles, you don't see this so much. In our English translations, you don't see this really, really what Jesus is saying here. Because in the original Greek language, this actually says, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. It looks totally different than what it appears in our English Bible sometimes. The emphasis of what Jesus does here with this, with the verbs that are used here, is he is trying to emphasize, don't stop. This isn't just a go one time and ask once. He is saying, I want you to always be asking. What does James say? What does what what the Apostle Paul tell us? Pray without ceasing. It's prayer without ending. It's always being in a, in a life of prayer. That doesn't mean that I'm constantly, nonstop, muttering a prayer as I go through my day. But it is constantly being in a mode of life to where no matter what happens, I immediately am prayerful. I'm constantly uh, where I am talking to God. And so Jesus, he's be persistent <coughs> for, for what God has to provide for you. Keep on asking. Keep seeking. Don't stop looking. What did Jesus say back in Matthew chapter 5 here of the Sermon on the Mount? Those who are hungering and thirsting for righteousness, they will be filled. It's for those that are continuing to seek what God has for them that God promises you will be filled if you're seeking. Keep knocking. Just because you don't get the answer or maybe it seems like nobody answers, don't stop. Continue to knock. Continue in uh, this process of seeking after what God has to provide. Now, Jesus applies this to prayer. We see several times in the gospel, especially the gospel of Luke, Jesus takes this idea of, of persistence in prayer, and he, he actually gives two parables that describe this. The first one is in Luke chapter 11, beginning in verse 5. Jesus tells this parable. He says, suppose one of you has a friend and goes to him at midnight and says to him, friend, lend me three loaves, for a friend of mine has come to me from a journey and I have nothing to set before him. And from inside he answers and says, do not bother me, the door has already been shut, my children and I are in bed, I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though he will not get up and give, give him anything because he is Uh, He is his friend, yet because of his persistence, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. Jesus uses this in a context of prayer. In talking about, it's not that God is sitting back and begrudgingly going, oh, I don't want to have to give you something. You're talking to me again. That's That's not the point of what Jesus is talking about here. Jesus is simply making one point, one application from this story, and that is when it comes to asking God, don't stop. Continue to ask. He tells again in Luke chapter 18, beginning in verse 1, says there, now now he was telling them a parable to show that at all times they ought to pray and not lose heart, saying in a certain city, There was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect man. There was a widow in that city, and she kept coming to him, saying, Give me legal protection from my opponent. For a while uh, he was unwilling, but after he said to himself, Even though I do not fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow bothers me, I will give her legal protection. Otherwise... By continually coming, she will wear me out. And the Lord said, 
Hear what the unrighteous judge said. Now will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry to him day and night? And will he delay long over them? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, he will find faith on the earth. Again, the comparison is not God to a judge who, is, who does not believe in God, obviously. The point that's being made here is a comparison. It's a contrast. If the persistence of this widow will eventually cause this judge to give her what she needs, he's making the contrast to, we serve the one and only true, loving, giving God. The one who is willing to give for anyone who asks if they have need. So if that judge will eventually give, if we're persistent in our prayer, if we will continue to go to God, will not our God give if those things, of course, are according to his will? And so Jesus, he applies this several times in his teaching of trying. And that's what he's saying in a very simplified way here in uh, in Matthew 7, verses 7 and 8. Again, in Matthew 7, verse 7, he says, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek. I'm going to change that. Keep asking, and it will be given to you. Keep seeking, and you will find. Keep knocking, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and he who keeps seeking finds, and to him who keeps knocking, it will be opened. So, that persistence of continuing to go to God. Now, we also see Jesus tell us what the reward will be if we will develop that persevering heart persistently. If we are persistently going to God with things that are going to be according to His will, things that are He will be approved of, then that is also keeping our minds focused on things that they should be focused on. If we are constantly in the mode of communication with God, that is one of the best ways for us to keep our minds focused on God and not be focused on things of the world. So then we can go even back into the Sermon on the Mount and we can see that we will store up for ourselves treasures in heaven and not on earth. Because we have our minds focused on God. We're in constant contact with God. And that keeps that focus where it needs to be. So what are the rewards then that come if we are persistent, if we do persevere in times like this? Well, one thing we know is that God wants to give good things to his his people. Not only does he want to, God delights in giving good gifts to his children. It's what he wants to do. And so we see here, look in verse 9. It says, Or what man is there among you who, when, he, when his son asks for a loaf, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, he will not, uh, he will not give him a snake, will he? If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give what is good to those who ask him? There's so much thought (coughs) in the world today that God causes so many bad things to happen. It amazes me how many times I'll stand and watch a news broadcast of some disaster and I'll see somebody, I don't know why God would do this. To this day, I have yet to see anyone say, I don't know why Satan would do something like this. Why doesn't the one who is evil, who does cause damage, why doesn't he ever get the blame? When we look at our God, we know that our God is one who not only wants to give good things, he will. He only gives good gifts. Now, will God allow things that are challenging, even sometimes they, they are devastating in our life. Will he allow those things to happen? Yes, he will. We can go back to James chapter 1 and we can see why. 
There's testing of our faith that produces perseverance, that strengthens us. So in other words, what God is allowing to happen, even in those worst of times, can be gifts from God to help us become better. God only gives what is good. And so when we look at, at, at what God is willing to do for us, we see from the example that's here, Jesus says, men, we as men, and Jesus, the word that, that is used here is the word evil. You, you are evil. All that is is a word that's contrasting who we as human beings are, who are sinful, what we look like in contrast to a holy God. So we as men, we know how to give good gifts to our children. So if that's the case, then how much more does God want to give to his children? How much more does the holy and righteous God, how much more will he give to his children? Now, I look at that, and it's not that he's going to give what I want. It's not that he's going to give everything that I've asked for. There are sometimes the answer, when I ask, he is always going to give me an answer. And sometimes his answer is yes, and I see those things in my life that take place. Sometimes God says, you need to wait. It's not time yet. These are all things. The illustration that Jesus uses here is with our children. Those who are parents, we understand this, don't we? There are many times our children come to us asking us for something, and it might not be something that is going to be bad for them, but there are times that we just say, no. And they don't understand it, and they get frustrated. And what do they do? You see them at Walmart all the time, right there in the fit aisle. You know that, what that fit aisle is when you check out at the register and all that candy and stuff that they put right down there, right at eye level for all of them, and when you say no, they fall down and throw a fit? That's the fit aisle. So as, they, as they, we see them there, we see the reaction of, of children when, when we say no. Well, there are a lot of adults that act the same way when God says no. They throw a fit. Well, why not? Well, you're so mean. I've heard that from my children before. And is that not what a lot of people are saying to God? Why is God so mean and not doing this for me? We need to understand that if God says no, it is the best for you. I might not understand it. I might not see it at the moment. But I, my faith tells me I know that it has to be the best response. That God can see the big picture that I can't see. There's some times with my children that I tell them, not yet. You need to wait. I'm not going to say no, but we need to wait. There's a reason for that. As a parent, I may know the reason for that. They may not. Well, but why not? You didn't say no, so why can't I have it now? There's a reason. So we, God sometimes his answer is the same way. That it may, may be years before we actually see the answer to a prayer that we have asked and when we get to that point, so many times in my life I've looked back and I've gone, man, if he would have given that to me then, it wouldn't have worked out the way that it worked out today. God could see the big picture. And then there's some times that God says yes. Sometimes that those prayers are answered almost immediately in ways that we are asking for them. But... These things, the way that Jesus is teaching them, and the way that this persistence that we're talking about is applied to prayer and how we approach God. Again, look at what James says in James 4 and verse 3. You ask and do not receive because you ask with wrong motives so that you may spend it on your pleasures. How many times has that been the reason why you said no to your children? Because you know the motives behind why they're asking. You know why they want it. It might be selfishness. It might be greed. It might be a, a reason that it's for their own pleasures. And you go, there, you, you don't need that. Well, sometimes God's saying, you're asking with the wrong motives. 
What you're asking for in and of itself might not be bad, but you are not asking with the right heart and the right motives behind it. Why do you want it? Why would I give that to you if I can see that if it fulfills a wrong motive, it's only going to lead you down a path that's going the wrong direction away from me? John, the Apostle John says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 14, he says, This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which we have asked from him. There's a lot of people that focus on verse 15. There's a lot of people that only look at this. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request which, he, which we, we have asked from him. They look at verse 15 and they say, he says that if I have faith and confidence that God hears me, then whatever I ask, he will give it to me. You know how many things I've asked of God that he's never given to me? Therefore, there must not be a God. They forgot verse 14. This is the confidence which we have before him, that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. Those things that I asked for, was it according to his will or was it according to my will? Was it according to what I wanted? Or was it according to what God would want? I know that if there's anything that I ask of God that is going to further his kingdom and his righteousness and do the work that I am supposed to be doing for him, I know without a doubt that he will bless me with what I need to make that happen. If it's according to his will. So that's sometimes a question we need to ask ourselves. If I look at something and I'm asking God for something, I, but he didn't answer me that. He didn't give me the answer to my prayer. My 18-year-old niece, when she, when she had cancer and she's laying in a hospital bed, and how many times we pray and pray and pray that she, she would be healed and she would be healthy and she'd be able to, 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 to grow and to thrive. And at 19 years old, she dies from her cancer. And I can look at God and I say, you told me that if I asked you, you would give it to me. I have to stop and say, but was that according to his will? You see, my niece was a faithful Christian. And according to God's will, she won. She was victorious over this life. And she is now with her God. And so according to God's will, everything worked out for the best. According to my will, I wanted her here with me. I wanted her here in this life. I didn't want my sister and her husband to go through that pain of all of the, the, the loss of a daughter. But if it's according to God's will, if I can see things through the eyes of God, if I can see things with the wisdom of God, then my whole perspective on life changes. I then need to begin looking at everything I do, everything I ask of God, every decision that I make, and begin running it through that filter of am I doing these things according to God's will? Or am I doing so according to my will? When we pray prayers, when we have prayer lists, we need to evaluate and see how much of that is what we want. And how much of it is what God desires and what God wants? We need to make sure that we focus on those things. God promises if you keep asking, if you keep seeking, if you keep knocking, those answers will be given. We put everything together that God tells us about prayer and about persistence of prayer. He tells us, but make sure that your faith is maintaining what you're asking of me, that it's according to my will, he says. And then you can have the confidence every single time you go before his throne to know, 
I will have what I ask if I do so according to his will. What about in your life? What have you been asking for? What are those things in your prayer life? Maybe you've even been persistent in prayer. Stop and think. Why am I asking for that? Am I doing it because it's what I want? Or am I willing to turn it over to God and say, Lord, your will be done. Whatever you believe is the best in this situation, I'm going to put it in your hands. And I'm going to trust you. And it might not be what I want. It might even cause pain in my life right now. But I trust you. I trust my God enough that no matter what the answer is, I know it will be the best possible answer for me in my life. Is that where your faith is? Is that how strong your faith and your belief in who God is and what he wants for you in your life, what it really is? And if not, then we need to take some time. We need to get together. We need to talk more about who God is in your life and what he wants for you and what he wants you to be doing for him and and to think about him because he wants what's best. That's a promise. If there's anyone this morning, maybe it's a challenge. Maybe it's a challenge of faith. Maybe there's someone that's struggling with, I just, I, don't, I can't see it. I'm having a hard time. And that happens. It's happened in my life. Of why is this happening? And the doubt begins to come in. And Satan begins to find his way into my mind to create doubts about my God. If that has happened, what can we do to help strengthen you and your faith? There's someone here this morning that you have never taken that step of obedience to the gospel of Jesus Christ. The Apostle Paul tells us that gospel, the gospel that he preached, the gospel by which those in Rome, as he was writing to, or I'm sorry, in Corinth, this gospel by which you were saved. He says that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, and three days later, according to Scripture, he was raised from the dead. That death, burial, and resurrection, have you obeyed that gospel? That the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 6 tells us the death, burial, and resurrection can, is connected to what we do in our response to the message of Christ. He says that we who have died to sin, that we have been buried with Christ in baptism to be raised in newness of life. The death, the burial, and the resurrection. That I'm buried with Jesus Christ in baptism, that my sins washed away, and then raised to walk in a brand new life. Now, I know without a shadow of a doubt that I have that connection with God. I know that that line of communication with God is always there. I know that now I am right with God. And I can begin that process of changing my life. That's why Peter said, repent, change, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. If you have not taken that step of obedience, are you willing to this morning? Are you willing to give your whole self to God and to His will? If there's anyone that needs the help, the prayers of the church here, or you need the help and the forgiveness of God himself. If you make that known, you could do that this morning. If you'll come forward as we stand, as we sing this song.
27. Is there five?